For more than 20 years, R.J. Palacio was an art director and graphic designer, designing book jackets for other people while waiting for the perfect time in her life to start writing her own novel. One day several years ago, a chance encounter with an extraordinary child in front of an ice cream store made RJ realize that the perfect time to write that novel had finally come. Wonder, the story of Augie Pullman, a boy born with a severe facial abnormality, was her first novel. Her new book is 365 Days of Wonder, Mr. Brown's Book of Precepts. Please join me in welcoming R.J. Palacio to the JCCSF. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being well, here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I, I, it's, it's been a pleasure so far. So Good. It's great. It's, yeah. it's only going to get better. I hope so. So, RJ, but you have another name, which is Raquel. Yes. And when I first read this book, I thought RJ Palacio was a man because <laughs> of the initials. So, RJ, Raquel, who are you? Why two names? You know, I was born, my name is Raquel Jaramillo. Uh, my parents are Colombian, so Jaramillo Jaramillo. Um, and, uh, and that's been my professional name and my name my whole life. Um, my mother was uh, sort of the uh, primary reason that I became a writer in terms of, uh, she always pushed me to, I mean, she, she believed that I would be a writer. And unfortunately, she, um, she passed away in 2002 before she got to see oh. my sort of turning into a writer. And um, I thought when I wrote this manuscript script and, and submitted it to a publisher, I thought it would be a really nice way of paying homage uh, to take her last name. Her maiden name was Palacio, Nellie Palacio. So um, I just kind of became RJ Palacio as a way of honoring her. So what should I call you? You can call me Raquel. Raquel. Yeah. Raquel, and so can you. So can you. <laughs> so I, um, in the introduction, I talked about this incident where you were at an ice cream store. Mm -hmm. This was the beginning, the genesis of wonder. For those here tonight who don't know, can you tell us what happened? Sure, I was with my um, two sons, and my older son was in the sixth grade at the time. My younger son was about three. They have a big age spread. And um, we found ourselves, uh, you know, I, I, we wanted some ice cream. I sent my older son inside with some money to get us some chocolate milkshakes. And my, old, my younger son and I waited outside on the bench in front of the ice cream store. And my younger son was still in the stroller. He was, you know, looking at me, kind of entertaining himself, looking at a board book, when all of a sudden I realized that sitting right next to me on the bench was a little girl um, who looks very much like Augie looks in the book. She, she had a craniofacial difference. And I, I have to admit, I kind of panicked for a second because I knew that the moment my little boy looked up and saw her that he would maybe react or, or say or do something that might hurt her feelings. Um, so not knowing exactly what to do, at the time I thought the best thing I could do was to try to leave the scene as quickly as possible and, and sort of avoid any situation from happening. Um, but before I could do that, my son did look up and he did react. And, um, anyway, it wasn't the way I wanted the scene to go down, and, and I kind of panicked and ended up wheeling the stroller away rather quickly and abruptly, and, and afterwards I kept really beating myself up about it because I kept on thinking uh, about all the other ways I could have and should have reacted. What I wished I had had the wherewithal to do is to simply turn to the little girl and started up a conversation and shown my son by an example, you know, that there was nothing to be afraid of, that there was nothing to fear, that, um, you know, just used it as a teaching moment. Instead, I kind of panicked, and uh, anyway, I was really mad at myself for that, and I kept thinking about it, um, and that night, I turned on the radio, and a great song by Natalie Merchant came on, oh. you know, Wonder, and it's all about being born different and unique, and it's also a celebration of, of being different, you know? And, and there was something about the optimism of that song and, and the, the, the words, you know, the, the idea that with love and with patience and with faith, she'll make her way. It just really clicked. And I just thought, okay, I'm gonna write a book and it's going to be called Wonder and it's going to be about what it must be like to have to face a world every day that doesn't know how to face you back. 
What um, a wonderful way to repair what you felt was not. It was, was like not one giant act of atonement. It really was. It was, it was an exploration too for me of, of how I, you know, it was like a big do-over for me, you know. And you put it in the book because a sim similar incident happens with Jack. Exactly, exactly. He's with his babysitter in the book. I was the babysitter, but... Uh, so yeah. I'm realizing now, and forgive me, in the introduction, I said something wrong. I said, uh, let's see, facial abnormality. I shouldn't have said that. I should have said facial difference. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the more PC term is probably facial difference. Okay. I, think, um, um, I, I think people are born with different genetic differences, and um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the un-PC word is. I don't think abnormality is the worst of them, but I think uh, it's better to go with difference. I think you're yeah. right. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's totally, it's good. Um, so Augie Pullman, just love that kid. I do too. He's really funny. And one thing that occurred to me and maybe some of the kids here tonight, you really seem to get boy speak down. Um, so often we read books where children are talking and they sound like little mini adults. Mm -hmm. And Augie and his friends don't sound like that. I imagine your sons had something to do with that. They, yeah, I, I actually consider myself more of a professional eavesdropper than a writer. I, you know, bo first of all, boys are, you know, let's face it, they're kind of loud. And, and so I'd come home from work after a long day and find six or seven boys playing Halo in my living room. And no matter where I went in our apartment, you know, we live in New York City, our apartment is small, um, you could hear them. So after a while, I just thought, well, you know what? I, I'm just going to start taking notes because it's better that way. Um, so also, you know, it's funny with kids. They think that, you know, it's funny. I mean, there are kids in the audience. I should tell you, parents are listening. When you're in the back of the car and we're driving you. <laughs> That's our secret know, in the whoops. car. <laughs> but uh, so I, I just I tend to listen a lot to my kids. Did they uh, know you were eavesdropping? I, you know, I don't think they realized that until after Wonder came out. And then they <laughs> said, wait like, a minute, well, that's minute. me. Exactly, exactly. So, so one thing that um, is so interesting and successful about this book is you write from different characters' point of view. Sometimes it's Augie, sometimes it's Jack, sometimes it's Summer. Why did you decide to do that? Um, you know, I really wanted, I, I didn't realize that I was going to go into different points of view right at the beginning. At first I thought it was just going to be from Augie's point of view, I was telling his story. But after a while, I started really getting curious about the motivation of the other characters, um, especially Via. I thought Via was a very, very interesting character and I wanted to explore her. Um, I wanted to figure out, okay, Jack Will, what was that about? Halloween, you know, and, and Summer, what, what compelled her to sit down with Augie on the first day? And I realized that to really tell the complete story of Augie Pullman, I had to leave his head a little bit because um, in order not to make him precocious, in order to make him seem like a real kid, I couldn't have him thinking things about other people that he would have no way of knowing. You he know? couldn't it's, be all-knowing. He couldn't be all-knowing, and, and I didn't want to write that because it would have felt false. So um, I gave myself the liberty of going into other people's points of view so that I could tell his complete story from every angle, and also because he doesn't really realize the impact that he has on other people. I think he knows, sure, people look at me and all of that, but I don't know if he understands the positive um, aspects of that impact that he has on people. So the one exception whose point of view you don't write from in Wonder is Julian. Right. And then you wrote the Kindle ebook mm -hmm. that I just read. I don't know how many of you here tonight have read the it. Julian T the Julian chapter? How many have read yeah. the Julian chapter? Wow. Yeah, what a good. revelation. Totally from Julian's point of view. Yeah. And an extraordinary story with his grandmother yeah. and the Holocaust and yeah, who yeah. knew. Yeah. <laughs> Why did that come later? You know, when I was writing Wonder, um, I knew that Julian wasn't a bad person. You know, because when you're writing and, and you're thinking about these characters, um, you have a whole backstory. In, in order to make them seem real, in order for the things that come out of their mouths to seem real, at least I do, I, I have a whole sort of picture of them and their background and their parents and their story. And it helps uh, with their motivation. And so I knew that Julian wasn't a bad kid. I knew he was doing some bad stuff, but I also knew that a lot of his meanness was driven by fear. 
And, um, and so he had a story to tell. It didn't belong in wonder, though, because when I tried to put it in wonder, what was happening was that it kind of hijacked the story. I mean, wonder is Augie's story from beginning to end. It's a story of his uh, journey through fifth grade. And the people that we hear from are people who can impart some or expand Augie's story and, and tell a little bit about it, maybe things that we wouldn't have otherwise known. Julian, I mean, the big problem with Julian is that he never even bothered to get to know Augie. Yeah. So he really had nothing to impart in terms of Augie's story. Having said that, he did have an interesting story to tell that I thought was a, a parallel narrative, not one that exactly intersected with Augie's, but that did um, enhance, you know, it, it was a, a story that kind of belonged in the wonder world, but not in that book. What's so interesting, I think, for many of the students here tonight who are maybe thinking about becoming writers is you tried some things out. Mm -hmm. You tried telling Julian's story and then you realize, wait a minute, mm -hmm. that doesn't work. Yeah. And that's so interesting in terms of the process. So much, I mean, this is something I learned um, because I've, I've been, as you know, a graphic designer, an artist, and I was also an editor for, for about eight years prior to writing Wonder. And, and one of the things you really learn being an editor um, is that so much of good writing is about what you leave behind, what you take out, and it's painful sometimes. And this is a lesson I remember learning when I was in art school. I remember spending, I had the six hour studio drawing class, and you know, used to draw models for six hours on these giant, giant pieces of paper. And there was one time, um, I had drawn this really beautiful hand, I remember of the model, but the, I couldn't get the rest of the, I couldn't, I wasn't getting it. In the end of the six hours, my teacher said, wow, that is a beautiful hand. And I, I was very proud, I was like, thank you. He said, but the rest is awful. I said, yeah, I know, I just couldn't get it to work. And he said, you should have gotten rid of the hand. Wow. And he was so, because, you know, sometimes you have to sacrifice the smaller part for the greater and good. it hurts. It does, but I mean, I think that's part of what making art is all about, knowing, knowing when to just leave off and start and, and what to keep out and what to put in. Mm. You mentioned Via, Augie's sister, and for those of us who don't know a lot about a family dynamic with somebody like Augie, it becomes apparent that it's not just Augie, it affects the whole family. And so Via, she's ashamed, she's jealous. There's so many sort of complicated things mm -hmm. that it's, it's a family situation. And we really do get the sense of that. Yeah, I thought, I th really liked Via. I think she's um, a great character. I love the fact that she, um, you know, she calls Augie on his stuff sometimes. I mean, she, you know, she's, she can be, she sees through him sometimes when he's kind of, you know, she, she feels for him, but I think she's also like, hey, come on. And he needs you know? that. He needs it. Because he doesn't want to be the subject no, of pity and he, treated with kid gloves exactly, all the time. And I think his parents have been a little, you know, they coddle him a lot. And I think Via's been very good about sort of yanking him and her parents into, uh, hey, come on, let's grow up here, let's get real. Um, and I think she's very good about seeing Augie's uh, specific you know, situation in, in the world and, and his challenges, and, and she says very clearly, you know, I think we've all spent so much time trying to convince ourselves that Augie's, you know, com you know not like, you know, that he, he's different, and, right. and we have to accept that. You know, so she's really, I think, a very smart girl. You also point out that um, everyone has baggage. So Augie has his, which is his facial difference. Mm -hmm. Jack has his, which he doesn't have as much money yep. as the rest of the kids. Some kids are, there's one um, Via's friend who Miranda, has a yep. nasty divorce yep. in her family. Mm -hmm. Julian's mother has yeah. some issues. Mm -hmm. So everybody is coming into this with something. Yep. And tell us why you made that decision. Well, because I really believe that everyone's got a story to tell, and, and it's hard for us to sometimes see the stuff that people are grappling with. Um, but we have to know that no one's life is perfect. Everyone's got something that they're, they wish they could change. And I think if we look at everybody like that, we see people 
with a little bit more compassion. I think, you know, it, it gives us a chance to take a deep breath and think, okay, well, maybe she was answering me rudely because she's having a bad day because you know, something is going on there and it's not me, you know? And, and I think it's a great way, I think it's a healthy way to look at the world um, with a little bit more compassion. Even Julian, the tough Even, guy, the popular guy, yeah. has these terrors yeah. and again, his mother, so. Yeah. It's yeah, like, he didn't, I think Julian is somebody that would have benefited from having parents like Augie. We all would. Yeah. <laughs> they're um, great. They're great. They're great. And so he was blessed with one, I mean, he, he was born with this, but he was blessed with this, you know, and, and, uh, and we all have those things that we're born with and things that we're, we're blessed with and, and, and that's just the way it is. And um, I think Julian, you know, he, he, his parents are kind of clueless. Uh, but he had this great grandmother Greatest. who was able to maybe guide him a little bit to a bit of an epiphany about himself. So I read where you said um, your experience with your sons in school taught you that our expectations of children are low. What do you mean? Well, you know, my, um, my older son was in the sixth grade when I started writing Wonder. He had just finished fifth grade, uh, first year of middle school. And he doesn't have any of the, uh, he doesn't have to deal with any of the issues that, you know, Augie has to deal with. Um, and yet he had a really tough fifth grade year. Betrayal of some good friends, um, feeling left out, not getting invited to some birthday, you know, that, the, the, the typical stuff. So painful. It's, it's hard to watch. And, um, and meanwhile, you know, you're friends with all, you know, socially, we're all friends with our, the parents of our kids' friends. I mean, it's just the way it is. And, and I, I'll have known, I mean, I'll have had these kids over at sleepovers for the last five years, and suddenly they're acting kind of like not so nice to, to my son. And, and what I kept on realizing is that um, sometimes, I mean, I'm not one of those helicopter parents. I would never make, I would never talk to parents about it or lecture anybody, but I was always a little bit surprised at how at that age, some of my friends would start, it started hanging back mm. from parenting. The same parents who I remember would hover at the sandbox in the park and, you know, be polite and, and you know, stress the virtues like that, you know, say thank you. And, and they were all over their toddlers about those kind of elemental virtues. And yet, you know, seven years later, they were very, very, well, you know, kids have to kind of come to their own conclusions and I don't want to interfere. And, and I think it's too young. Mm. My personal feeling is that it's a little bit too young to completely abandon them. They still need us at that age. So we should be a little helicoptery. I, th I think it's okay to set a course. Mm -hmm. And to what I, what I try to say is it's okay to, ex what, what I've kept on hearing from friends was, well, you know, all kids go through a mean phase or this is, this is the age when they start getting mean to each other. And I think, well, I don't know about that. Mm. I mean, I, if that's what we're expecting, then, if, then they will comply. But if we maybe raise the bar a little bit and say, you know what, it's not okay. It's not okay. It's okay for you not to be friends with your old friends anymore because I understand that people change, but it's not okay for you to treat your old friend terribly, mm -hmm. um, to make a point or to be popular or whatever. You know, there are certain kind of lines in the sand that I think it's okay for us to maintain. And so that, you know, when I wrote Wonder, I had that kind of in mind. I, what I really wanted was to try to raise the bar um, and, and hope that maybe everybody would expect a little bit more of our kids and the way they treat each other. And out of that, and we're gonna talk about Mr. Brown, came Choose Kind, but before we do, you mentioned, whoops, you mentioned the Halloween incident. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I have to tell you, I was doing fine until that. Right. And I lost it. Yeah. I just completely lost it. There yeah. was, I was a puddle. So talk about the Halloween incident and writing it and the reactions to it. Did, did that make any of you cry or feel terrible? Yeah, yeah, I see some hands going up. Yeah, I remember reading that to my, because um, you know, I, I, I read the book aloud for the first time to my son when he was, in, he was seven or eight years old, and, um, and he was completely shocked when it turned out that Jack, it was Jack in the, in the costume saying those mean things. And I was shocked. As a writer, I have to tell you, I didn't have an outline 
So I didn't know from one day to the next what was going to happen. I mean, I, the characters kind of, there comes a point when you're writing when the characters are telling you what's going to happen next. So I remember writing that, and then it turned out it was Jack saying that. It was, and I remember thinking, oh no, you know, I was so disappointed in my boy Jack. Um, <laughs> And, I, and that's why I really wanted to explore what will happen there, you know, and, uh, and I, I think I, I really wanted to be able to show that, and even with Julian as well, that sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we fall into feeling some peer pressure. Sometimes kids, um, they say or do things that they wish that they could undo, like me at the ice cream store. Um, but it doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't define you. It doesn't even define Julian. Julian was, did some bad things, but it didn't mean that he was always going to be a bad kid. And I, I think, you know, there's, there's no way you could look at a 10 or 11 year old and think that there's no possibility of redemption. You know, I think they all have the capacity for tremendous nobility. And, um, and Jack is the same as everyone. So he made a mistake. Um, and then he rectified it, you know? Well, this is something else that's so interesting if you're a young writer, or for any writer. So some writers plot the whole thing out, and yeah. they know exactly where it's going, beginning, middle, end, and you're a writer who developed the characters, and then all of a sudden, whoa, what I happened? was constantly being surprised. I remember there was that one scene that happens later on um, when they're in the woods, and, uh, you know, Jack and, and, and Augie have been, you know, beaten up a little bit by those mean seventh graders and they're running away and they were rescued by Amos and Miles and Henry. And now they're like, sort of like, ah, oh, they've escaped and they're all kind of like, just kind of huddling together. And, and uh, Jack turns to his rescuers and he's like, hey guys, you know, thanks. You know, and he does the high five thing and they're like, oh yeah, dude, it's, you know, good we were here or whatever. And then Augie realizes that he's, you know, he's gonna do the same thing and he's gonna raise his hand in the air and say, yo guys, thank you. But he doesn't know if they're going to reciprocate or not because these are the same kids who have avoided touching him all year long, you know, and, and yet he has the courage to do that in that darkness. And there was that one moment when I was writing that, I didn't know whether or not they were going to reciprocate. Wow. And I remember when they did, I was so happy. <laughs> it just felt really good. It's like, oh, yay. So, um, so yeah, I, you, you kind of write yourself into these positions and you don't really know what's going to happen. So let's, let's talk about Choose Kind mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Brown and the precepts, because of course your new book is 365 Days of Wonder, Mr. Brown's book of precepts. Right. And well, tell us about that. Well, the Choose Kind thing actually is something that I, I wish I could take credit for in terms of um, how it came about, but I, it was inspired by that quote, the Wayne Dyer quote. Um, which it appears in Wonder. It's uh, Mr. Brown's September precept. If you have the choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. And almost from the beginning, that quote just kind of became viral, that people just started really picking up on it. And um, the, my, my publisher um, thought, well, that's a great idea. Let's kind of make something of that. And they started this website, uh, the Choose Kind website, where um, they invite people to share their stories about choosing kind or standing up to bullies and, and you take a pledge and um, you can actually print out a certificate and uh, it really caught on and, and even beyond that website, it's just, um, it's become like this national movement. It's, it's really pretty amazing. It's I, so great. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And it's so simple. It's so simple and I mean, you know, to get these emails that I get from fifth graders saying, you know, after I read Wonder, I really, it made me want to be a nicer person. It's like, it's kind of, it's heartbreaking. It's, yeah. it's, it's really lovely. Um, Mr. Brown. Yeah. Love Mr. Brown. I do too. Now, is he based on somebody you knew or where does Mr. Brown come from? Well, there, my high school English teacher was named Mr. Brown. He was a tall man with a blonde beard who was very, very influential. Um, uh, one of those teachers that, you know, we all, if we're lucky to have, we have that one or two teachers that really uh, define you. And he uh, taught me how to be a reader. He was a great teacher. And so when I was writing the book, you know, you kind of just pull characters from the air, from memory, and I, I started writing about this English teacher named Mr. Brown, who in my mind was my high school English teacher. And, um, and then the precepts started because um, he never taught precepts, but I used to 
um, I was a big reader when I was, you know, always, but when I was about 13 or 14 years old, I, I started um, a little scrapbook of, of precepts or quotes, like whenever I'd read something that I, was, that I really liked, I'd write it down, or if I had a fortune cookie that I thought was really cool, <laughs> I'd put it in there. And I always thought these precepts were um, kind of cool. They're like motivational quotes, personal motivational quotes. Um, so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if an English teacher actually used this concept of precepts as a way of teaching essay writing and, and getting his kids to really dialogue about things that are important. And, and so that's how that came about. Does your high school teacher, Mr. Brown, know that he was yeah, the... I, you know, no, uh, or maybe he does. I don't know. It's, it's, um, but you haven't heard from him. I haven't heard from him, but I did. I was at, because uh, I do school presentations, and, and I actually show a picture of him in my presentation. And one time, I, someone in the audience um, was, I guess he's a, he teaches teachers now, and um, was one of his students as a teacher, you know, and, and she, she recognized him, and she said she was going to reach out to him. So... Uh, yeah, he's in New York City somewhere. I mean, I think he's retired now. You'll hear from him. I hope so. So I'd like to ask you to read from 365 Days of Wonder, Mr. Brown's Book of Precepts, one of my favorite chapters called Glitter. Oh, great. So let's have a listen. And this is Mr. Brown talking. So in between um, the precepts, he also has 12 essays that he writes, kind of almost like blog posts or something. So this is in his words. Kindness can spread from person to person like glitter. Anyone who's ever introduced glitter into any kind of art project at school knows exactly of what I speak. You can't shake it off you. You pass it on to the next person. Its sparkling remnants linger for days. And for each tiny dot you find, you know that a hundred more have seemingly vanished. But where did they go? What happens to all that glitter? I had a boy in my class last year whose name was August. He was quite special, and not because of his face. There was just something about his indomitable spirit that captured me and a lot of the people around him. The year turned out to be a raging success for Augie, and I was very glad about that. Now, I'm not naive enough to think that a happy ending to a fifth grade year will guarantee him a happy life. I know he'll have more than his share of challenges, but what I gleaned from his triumphant year was this. He has what he needs inside of him to stand up to life's challenges. Augie will have a beautiful life. That's my prediction. Uh, should I, and I'll just end there? No, no, keep no, going. okay. Keep going. Uh, um, I got an email from him the other day that kind of validates this prediction. So then there's the, the little, yeah, like little email exchange. Hey there, Mr. Brown, long time no speak. I hope you're having a great summer. I sent you my precept last month. Hope you got it. It had a giant fish on it from Montauk. So I'm writing to thank you for sending me Julian's note in the mail. Whoa, I did not see that coming. When I opened your letter, I was like, what is this other envelope? And then I opened it and I saw the handwriting and I was like, no way, is Julian sending me mean notes again? You probably don't know this, but Julian left some really mean notes in my locker last year. Anyway, it turned out that this note wasn't a mean note. It was actually an apology. Can you believe it? It was sealed, so maybe you didn't read it, but this is what the note said. Dear Augie, I want to apologize for the stuff I did last year. I've been thinking about it a lot. You didn't deserve it. I wish I could have had a do-over. I would be nicer. I hope you don't remember how mean I was when you're 80 years old. Have a nice life, <laughs> Julian. P.S. If you're the one who told Mr. Tushman about the notes, don't worry, I'm not mad. I'm kind of in a state of shock about this note, by the way. He's wrong about me being the one who told Mr. Tushman. It wasn't me or Summer or Jack. Maybe Mr. Tushman really does have microscopic spy satellites tracking everything we do in school, I don't know. Maybe he's even watching me right now. If you're listening, Mr. Tushman, I hope you had a great summer. <laughs> anyway, just goes to show you never know with people. Um, should I continue? I, I think we can yeah? stop there. Okay, but yeah, yeah. How about a little bit of applause? Oh, thank for... you. <laughs> thank you. So for those of you who haven't yet read 
365 days of wonder, lots of good stuff in there that you don't know yet. We're gonna get to your questions in a minute, so I want you to get ready with them. But before we do, mm -hmm. I noticed that you got all your favorite stuff in there. Narnia, yeah. The Hobbit, yeah. The Sound of Music. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> Star Wars. Yeah. You're a Star Wars geek, right? Totally, totally, yeah, <laughs> totally. Aren't you working on a project, a Star Wars project, or is that completed now? You know what? I am working on a, a Star Wars project, but it's going to, it's not the one that I signed on to do originally. Originally, I was going to be doing the novelization of Star Wars Episode Four, um, the story of Luke Skywalker. But I had just a loaded schedule uh, with all this stuff, basically, and with the fall tour. So I backed out of that. I'm probably going to be doing another project for them, but I don't know what yet. Okay. I'm not, I'm, yeah. Star I'm, Wars is still in there. Star somewhere. Wars is in there, yeah. One other character I want to talk about or ask about, and then we'll go to the audience, as I said, Charlotte. Mm -hmm. So we have those, summer is just so good. And Jack, even though he makes a mistake, is a great guy. Mm -hmm. Charlotte's different. Charlotte's somebody who isn't mean, but doesn't particularly extend herself. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of Charlottes out there. So what is your book trying to say to the Charlottes? Um, you know, it's interesting, because sometimes I get asked, who is the character that I would have been most like if I were in the fifth grade? And I know that people are hoping that I'll say Summer, and I wish I could say Summer, but it takes a very special person to be Summer. And I don't think I had the courage to be Summer when I was that young. I think Charlotte is the one that I personally probably would have been the most like at that age. Mm -hmm. Um, because Charlotte is a very relatable person. She is, as you said, she was never one of the mean kids to Augie. She never, you know, she, she, she was always nice to him, but nice from a distance, you know, hi Augie, you mm -hmm. know, she'd wave at him and, and uh, you know, she kind of got involved when they were having their war, but not in an obvious way. I mean, she, she's behind the scenes nice. Um, and I kind of wanted to contrast that to me, Charlotte and Summer are sort of stand-ins for the, the difference between being nice and choosing kind. Mm -hmm. uh, being nice is great. It's a great start. Um, but choosing kind is, is that much harder, and it's, it's more of an action. It's more of a deliberate getting out of your comfort zone to do the right thing. So it's kind of, you know, the difference between Charlotte just being nice from a distance and Summer actually going out of her way to sit down with this kid on the first day of school and really extending herself and putting herself out there to um, the discussion and the gossip of other people, you know, which is not an easy thing to do at that age. And leave the party with the popular kids. Uh, that absolutely. was a great moment. That was a great moment. She, you know, and that had nothing to do with Augie. That was just who she was. Um, so, so I thought it, it's kind of, um, Charlotte is a much more maybe re relatable character, but I think at the end of Wonder, I, I, you know, from her precept, I think we can gauge that she, you know, her precept is, um, it's not enough to be friendly, you have to be a friend. I think she's learned something. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm planning on writing two more short e-books along the lines of the Julian chapter, and one of them will be from Charlotte's point of view. Wow. Yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. All right, well, we're going to turn up the lights yeah. now, and it's your turn, so just put up your hand, and please don't be shy, because on the way home, you're going to think, oh, I wish yeah. I had asked her, and I already see some hands going up, so we're going to come to you with the microphones. Get ready, and where are the microphones? Uh, ladies? Hello? Just one second. Ben, can you get Siri and our ladies with the microphones because we're ready to take some questions? Actually, I can do it. Are you sure? Yeah, we need the microphones because we are ready to take questions. Good question. Just raise your hand. Here's Judy. There's, there's some up there. Do any of your experiences have anything to relate with what the characters are going through? Um, you know, a lot of the subplots and a lot of the little incidents that happen in the book 
were kind of loosely based on here. things that happened to my family or things um, that I remember from my childhood. For instance, uh, there's that little, tiny little story about Jack finding the sled. Um, and that actually happened to me when I was like in the fifth grade. I remember finding this old sled in the park and, and taking it home and, and decorating it and making it into something really special. And then when I went back to school on Monday, hearing that it was like the discarded garbage of some kids in school, and I felt really badly about that for some reason. And so a lot of those little stories, um, side stories, were drawn from um, life. Uh, people that know me well um, point out the similarities between Augie's family's dynamics and, and mine. You know, my, my husband's like Nate. He's really funny. And, um, you know, so, so there's, you know, there are lots of parallels and lots of overlaps. So, yeah. The next question is right down here in front. Have you ever sought out the girl at the ice cream shop? Oh. That, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I did go back uh, to the ice cream store just to ask around to see if anybody knew who she was or anything like that, and, and no one did, so she must have just been passing through. Um, she was with her mother and a friend or, or maybe a sister that day, so, um, you know, there are times when I, I get a lot of emails, and I often get emails from kids who have craniofacial differences, and, you know, I keep waiting for that one email to say, you know, that was me in the ice cream store, but the truth is, uh, even though that moment was a very important moment in my life, I, I have a feeling, unfortunately, that things like that happen to her quite often, and it might not have um, really stuck out for her. I'm also hoping that it happened so quickly that maybe she never even realized. I know the mom definitely saw what was happening, but I'm not sure she was very young, and maybe she didn't really quite realize what was going on. Next question up here to your right. Oh. Where did you get the ideas, idea of Daisy the dog? Oh, Daisy the dog. Um, Daisy was uh, kind of based on, um, my husband and I had had a dog named Dune, and um, Daisy was kind of, you know, a, I mean, he, my husband did come home one day with a dog that he bought from a homeless person. Um, yeah, uh, so, you know, that was kind of uh, based on that, and, and I thought it was important for Augie to experience something that, you know, here he is always talking about wanting to be ordinary. And um, unfortunately, you know, the, the death of a dog, of a beloved pet, is something that a lot of children experience. It's an ordinary part of growing up, sad as it is. And I thought it was important for him to experience something that had nothing to do with his face. It had to do with something um, beyond him. Next one is up here to your left, up in the back. Um, you said you were writing two other mini stories after the Julian chapter, and one is Charlotte. With mm -hmm. who, who is the other person? Christopher. Christopher is, uh, if you remember, in Wonder, Augie talks about a, a friend he had before he goes to school who moves away to Connecticut. And um, we don't really hear from Christopher at all. He's a very minor blip of a character, but uh, he actually has a story to tell. And he was there when they brought Daisy home the first time, for instance. So he'll be able to tell that story. To your right here. If you were going to add one more character to the book with a different experience than everyone else, what do you think it would be? Great mm. question. That is a great question. Um, I suppose I would, if I were going to write yet another ebook, I, I was toying with the idea of writing from Amos's point of view. Amos is um, the kid that turns out to be Augie's protector in the woods, and um, he rises to the occasion. You know, he's, he's uh, I think, what I think is nice about um, a lot of the characters, I guess, in Wonder, and, and my belief about the way most kids are, is that given a chance, most kids will do the right thing, um, and, uh, and Amos does the right thing at that particular moment in time. Next one is up here to your left. Why did you write a question on Via's boyfriend? Sorry, a chapter on Via's boyfriend. Um, you know, because again, he, uh, he was somebody that during that year, because remember, Wonder takes place in terms of a narrative. It takes place, at, it starts in the beginning of fifth grade and it ends at the end of the fifth grade. So anybody who intersects in terms of, um, it, it, whose lives inter intersect with uh, the Pullman family at that time 
is worth exploring, especially if they can tell us anything about Augie that we didn't know before. And I think Justin is able to really tell us not so much about Augie, but about Via and Miranda. So he's able to fill in a lot of the pieces um, that we might not be able to have access to without hearing his voice. I think he's an interesting character too because he is a stand, he's the outsider. He doesn't know this family, so he's kind of meeting them as we're meeting them. And I think he's got a very honest reaction to them as well. And you're right here. So. How old do you think the girl was? I think she was very young. She was probably around five or six. Good question. We have another question up here. What gave you the idea for Justin? I mean, Julian? Oh, Julian or, or well, Julian, uh, you know, he wasn't really based on any particular person, but I think we've all known a Julian in our lives. Um, so he was kind of based on people I remember from growing up. And Justin was a little bit, he was fashioned a little bit in my mind on my, um, my son was taking violin lessons. And even though his teacher was 40 years old, I, I imagined what he was like when he was 15. So he had glasses and... <laughs> On your right here. Um, how come you revealed that uh, Jack liked Summer at the very end of the book? Like, because I think he liked her. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I think he had a little crush on her. Next question. I would have if I'd been Jack. I, absolutely. <laughs> We're over here to you. Oh, sorry. Have you ever considered? Um, making a chapter on the farting nurse in the <laughs> <laughs> book? Wow, maybe. I, that's a good idea. I should think about that. I'm going to think about that a little bit. <laughs> uh, on your right here. Uh, did you base any of the other characters, not Augie, on real people? Uh, yeah, you know, most of the kids are actually based on kind of like mashups of kids that I know. Um, so like Augie's kind of a mashup of my older son at the time and his best friend at the time, a kid who used to kind of, um, he had kind of long goth hair and he used to mumble under the hair a lot. And so whenever I would think about Augie talking, I would think of this kid, Ben. Um, Jack Will was actually based on these two brothers that I knew when, again, they were friends of my older son um, and they would come over and one was named Jack and one was named Will. And so the mom would come over and pick them up from play dates and she'd be like, okay, Jack, Will, it's time to go. <laughs> and that kind of just stuck. But they were, they were both kind of spunky little, like little rascal kids. And, uh, and Summer was actually based on a little girl I knew named Summer, who was really one of the sweetest little kids I've ever known. She was absolutely adorable. Next one's over here. Why didn't you add any grown-up perspectives? Oh, that is a great question. You know, I really wanted to keep Wonder, um, I wanted to keep the focus, I wanted to make it a kid's book. I wanted to make it a book that kids would like. And I, I knew that if I opened it up to the parents' perspective, it might take a different tone. Um, because, you know, the parents are represented only the way Augie and sometimes Via sees them. So they're a little idealized. They're a little bit, they only show one side of themselves to Augie. I think they show, a, they try to keep a very positive, brave um, face to Augie because they have to. I think they, especially the mom, wants to stay positive. But it doesn't mean that she doesn't have some moments in the middle of the night or some moments when she's out with her friends where she's not, where, you know, she, she might get mad at people. She might get frustrated at, at what's going on and, and um, I could have explored that, but I think it would have taken a different tone, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep it purely uh, a book in the voice of children. And you're right. Um, one of my favorite scenes in the book is where Justin goes up to Julian and defends Jack Will. Mm -hmm. How did you get the inspiration for that part? Um, you know, I really think it's because my, my younger son at the time, he was playing Suzuki violin, and he had this violin teacher who would come, and and the violin case kind of looks like a little machine gun case, and it just, I don't know, it just, I, I, I don't know how sometimes ideas come to you, um, but they just do, and, uh, and so I just thought, wouldn't it be funny if 
he pretended it was a machine gun and <laughs> did a little Clint Eastwood accent and yeah, you know, so. Next one's over here. Um, are you gonna do a sequel of him in high school or um, maybe eighth grade? Oh, that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I probably won't. I think that um, I kind of, I really like where Wonder ended. Um, and I, I think aside from the small, the little e-books that kind of, I think, aren't sequels, they just kind of fill in little gaps um, and tell a little, they complete the story even more. Um, the idea of like going back and exploring Augie at different time periods, um, right now isn't that appealing to me because I like ending where I ended. Having said that, you know, I wrote, I started writing Wonder when my older son had just finished fifth grade. My older son is just entering college now. For all I know, I'll just have lots of new material and, and, <laughs> and we'll see Augie you will. in college. I, I'm sure, yeah. So, uh, you know, maybe. I won't say completely no. And you're right here. Um, if you wrote an ebook about Miranda, what do you think would happen? Hmm. Well, I think at the end of Wonder, um, Miranda, I think it's safe to say that Miranda and Via are friends again, which um, is kind of nice. I think that, you know, they had their little separation, they went their separate ways, they, um, Miranda went and did her little crazy exploration and her pink hair and all that, but at the end of the day, she wanted to, she wanted to kind of come back to the Pullman fold. Um, so I think her uh, point of view would probably be about being friends with Via again. Next one's over here. Um, this is about the second book. Uh, which is your favorite precept that you wrote? Oh, that's a great question. And my if favorite. You need this. You yeah. Can have um, it. Actually, I actually brought my phone because I thought someone might ask, and I took pictures because it's easier than leafing through. Oops, there's a picture of my dog. Sorry. Hold <laughs> on. Wait. Maybe it's not much. Oops. Wait. Wait. Here we go. Okay. I had a couple, so I'm going to name a couple of my favorites. Um, one of my favorite quotes is a quote that I remember first hearing when I was watching Winnie the Pooh with my older son, and he was two. You are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. And Christopher Robin says that to Winnie the Pooh, and I think it's one of my favorite. I actually sent this little JPEG to my older son in college the other day because he was having a down day. So, yeah, don't tell him I... I said that. <laughs> um, You've got an oh, mom. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And there's also another quote that I really love. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And that's by Margaret Mead. I love that quote. I think that is one of the most beautiful quotes. And then, you know, in the Precepts books, I actually had a Twitter contest. Uh, for two weeks, I asked people to submit their own personal precepts, and some of those made it into the book. And there's one by a girl named Kate, and it's be the person who can smile on the worst day. Uh, that's brilliant. So um, there are a bunch of quotes in there. I have to say I, I'm really proud of this book in terms of the, oh, yeah. the selection of quotes. You they, can open um, up anywhere and yeah. just get a thought for the day. That, yeah, pretty much. And they yeah. all work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. And you're right here. What question do you have for the kids who are different? What question do I what have? Advice? Sorry. What advice? advice? Oh, you know, I, it's, that's a hard question for me to answer because in a way, I feel like, well, who am I to give them any advice? You know, I, I you know, so much of writing this book has been about imagining or extrapolating um, what it must be like to have to deal with the same things that Augie has to deal with, uh, to, to have to, 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 to be Augie's mother. I mean, I, I've, you know, I'm lucky. I I've, I've have two children that haven't had to deal with these issues. So, so in many ways, I, I often wonder, well, who am I to write about these things? And yet exploring um, through the writing process was a very important way for me to sort of really reach an understanding about what it must be like. So I feel like I'm not in a position to give advice to anybody who in reality does look like Augie or, or does experience these things, um, except to thank them for just living their lives and um, 
you know, certainly if I could see that little girl, I would say thank you for being the inspiration uh, for me, for this book. Thank you for making me think about all these, these things that I'd never thought about before. Um, so, but I, I don't feel like I can give advice to anybody who's, who's dealing with it. We have uh, four more, um, and we're going to take those. And thank you, because that's all we have time for. So let's Next go for it. over here. I'm going to break the mold by being the adult to ask a question. <laughs> but, um, so I had a, when I was teaching fifth grade, I had a student like Augie, a female student. And the school was really good at including her, and, and kids really worked to include her. But by the time she was in eighth grade, and at that time I then transitioned to teaching seventh grade, it really fell apart. Mm -hmm. And the acceptance that she had seen in fifth grade was no longer there when kids went through puberty, started liking each other mm -hmm. in romantic ways, and she found herself more and more on the outside of the circle. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the solution to that is, because we certainly tried very hard, but um, mostly because my son asked for the sequel. I think that it could be really interesting to explore the sequel, so I don't want you to... To, to just That's, say, well, <laughs> it's over. Because I think the issues become more and more complex. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and I, I, Sorry. No, 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 go ahead, yeah. And then just one, uh, as, as a teacher, I would love to see you release um, your, your edits uh, so that even just for one chapter, so that kids can see the various revisions that you went through. Oh. Um, and you could do that online or whatever, but just yeah. say, look, this is, this is how this chapter evolved over time, I think that'd be really incredible. Oh, that, that, that would be, that would be very, um, that would be great of me, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> um, but I, I do, I do see your point about writing, uh, about Augie later on and, and, um, and in terms of, uh, the journey that these kids have to face, I, not to not to minimize it because I'm, I'm I would never do that, but in a way, seventh and eighth grade is not easy for anybody, and we all get through it. And so my hope would be that as hard as it was for that girl in the eighth grade, that eventually, you know, she'll come on the other side, like we all do. We get through it, and we get stronger. And I, I think the real point for me, really, the the point of wonder. The point of Augie, the reason that Augie's a wonder, isn't because of the way he looks. Uh, it's not even because, because he's such a special kid or anything like that. It's because I feel like he really has in him everything he needs to get through those eighth grade years, you know, those hard years and those moments. And, and I think that's really what makes him special, which is why I think wonder is finished in a way, because I think we can gauge from the way he dealt with the fifth grade that He's got everything he needs inside of him right now, and that's not going to change. Things are going to get hard. He's not going to have an easy life, but he's also got all the stuff that he needs around him. His parents, you know, he's got a support group, um, and I, I'm hoping that he will be able to rise to all the challenges that life will throw at him. On your right here. How do you feel writing about Augie and the people that supported him and then the people that were being mean to him and the people that were staying away from him? Wow, these are really great questions, guys. Um, I, I'll tell you, it was good. It felt always felt really good writing um, from Augie's point of view and all. It was kind of hard for me at times to write, uh, to put words in the mouths of the characters who weren't saying nice things about Augie mm. at times because I, I was always conscious of the fact that maybe um, someday someone will read this book who identifies with Augie for, for reasons um, you know, that, that are very specific, you know, and, and um, um, maybe they, they have some of Augie's uh, issues and, and differences. And um, I didn't want to ever um, create or write something that would make them feel badly or, or maybe make them wonder, is that what people think about me when, you know, and, and all of that. Um, having said that, I think it was important in order to make the book seem real, to have people react in a realistic way, um, to make it seem believable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of have to admit, it's a delicate balance. Next question over here. Do you like to make a movie? <laughs> Well, I, you know, it's kind of almost not up to me. I, the, the people in Hollywood who make movies have come to me, and, and uh, there's a, there are a couple of producers 
the same guys who um, produced uh, Twilight and The Hunger Games and, and The Muppet Movie. Um, <laughs> and they say that they're going to make a movie. And um, they've, they've written a script and they've hired a director. So it looks like it's going to be a movie. Having said that, I think, um, you know, we'll see. I, I don't know. And I don't have that much control. I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll see. I don't want them to make a movie. It's not going to be if it's not going to be a good movie. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd rather them not make a movie. But right. we'll see. Yeah, let, let's hope, right? <laughs> um, Last but not least. Okay. Did you ever feel like the characters had thoughts you weren't aware of? Ooh, yes. All the time, they were constantly surprising me. Something would come out of their mouth, and I'd be like, "Oh, whoa." And, uh, and that was always fun. When, to be surprised by these characters that kind of come from you, is, it's, a, it's a really fun process. So I want to remind, first of all, the questions were Fantastic. just amazing. Really. Wow. You guys, yeah. so good. And I want to remind you that Raquel will sign books. Um, so join us, and you'll have your books signed. Thanks to all of you for being here tonight. Your great questions. Most of all, thank you to you. Thank you very much. RJ I really Palacio. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay. We're going to sneak awesome. back. Okay. That was absolutely.